okay, with respect to AIDS. Okay. All right, so the question we want to ask uh, comes from Richard Price in a review of uh, the literature on global so civil society and international moral campaigns. Why do some campaigns succeed and others fail? And this is a very, um, this question gets very much at the heart of my work. Why? A couple of years ago, I wrote an article on the slave trade, the new global slave trade, that appeared in Foreign Affairs, which is a leading policy journal. People in the policy uh, world tend to look at it. And after I wrote this article, a friend of mine wrote me an email. I've decided email is a very unsatisfactory way to communicate in many <laughs> important respects. But he writes me an email saying, uh, Dear Ethan, saw your article. Why are you wasting your time? Why are you wasting your time? And at first I was thinking, hmm, what did he mean by that? I was thinking at first what he meant is no one in academics cares about this stuff, which is true. That's a you know, pretty true statement, at least in kind of mainstream international political economy. People are not really interested in the world's most vulnerable people, particularly slaves. There isn't much on this, so maybe that's what he was saying, is that this is not very interesting in terms of the mainstream IPE community. But now, as I've thought about it in the context of the work today, maybe he meant something different. And you'll see what I'm getting at. All right, so why do campaigns succeed? There's a constructivist literature, which you're all familiar with. I don't think I have to go over in detail. The spread of new norms is due to uh, some combination of activist characteristics, target characteristics, and issue characteristics. Uh, and it's that, uh, those coming together that makes for successful campaigns. Again, Price and others, myself, uh, argue that this constructivist literature tends to be post hoc in its explanations. Looks at a bunch of uh, case studies, decides what was successful, and sees these particular uh, characteristics of them. Okay? Uh, so, you know, for example, no bodily harm. I've been in the military for much of my life. Believe me, there's a lot of bodily harm that goes on out there. I don't see powerful movements to stop it. Okay? The realist challenge, most famously put forward by Kaufman and Pape, states almost never pursue international moral goals requiring significant costs in income, lives, or risk to national security. Okay? And what I want to do in my work is look at this question of price and, in a sense, in the context of this realist challenge to understand, again, why do campaigns sometimes succeed and others fail? All right? Is the realist challenge correct? If so, why is it correct? That states almost never pursue costly moral action. Okay, so that's kind of what I want to do to set the problem up. Uh, by the way, I should say, I'm a New Yorker, which means feel free to interrupt. <laughs> you know, otherwise you won't get a word in edgewise. You don't have to sit there politely. If you don't understand something or just disagree, just, okay? And I'm also in an economics department. Believe me, economists like you put your name up and the argument starts, you know? What's the derivative of that name? You know, it's, uh, you know. So, anyway. Uh, so I want to uh, sketch the cosmopolitan approach to international moral action, model its limits, talk about the role of global society, again, modeling it uh, with uh, ARVs as our case study, and talk about some of the implications, okay? And as I say, feel free to stop me. So, this is really interesting. When I wrote this book, I found I got myself involved in a heated controversy with the political theorists. And the political theory crowd these days, particularly the moral philosophy crowd, is uh, very much cosmopolitan in its orientation. Uh, and I think this kind of expresses cosmopolitan ideas, that national borders have no ethical meaning, only individuals are objects of ethical concern and every individual has equal moral worth. That international arrangements are unjust to the extent that they make some people worse off, uh, no matter where they're located. So to think, you know, think in terms of our case today, intellectual property rights, I have a lot of acronyms up there. Again, feel free to interrupt me if I'm not explaining them clearly. Intellectual property rights on pharmaceuticals may impede the poor's access to new drugs by limiting competition from cheap generics. That's an institutional arrangement IPR that makes some people worse off, and the argument is that would be unjust. And therefore, international justice requires improving the lives of those who are made worse off by these arrangements. Thus, the effects of IPR protection must be mitigated somehow. 
for example, by making new drugs universally available. Okay? So these are cosmopolitan arguments. And in this book, uh, for example, I reject cosmopolitanism. Why? Because I'm a Rawlsian. And I will tell you why I reject cosmopolitanism from a Rawlsian perspective and why I think Rawls rejects Pogge and Bites in his work, the late John Rawls. Ends up, this is a battle between Rawls and his own students. And I end up on the Rawls side of the equation. I'll tell you why. Now, what's interesting to me, uh, if I go back to um, why I focus on political feasibility, uh, this book was the subject of a conference at Rutgers. I was very honored that Rutgers put together this very nice conference, and some of the leading political theorists came. Uh, Matthias Rissa, Charles Bites, Tom Pogge, you know, this uh, heavy-hitting crap. And I found we were talking past one another. Why? Because the political theorists, the moral philosophers say, Ethan, this is a theoretically impoverished account of international justice. Why? Because for these moral philosophers, they want to imagine a world from scratch. And really the challenge of moral philosophy is to start from scratch and to think you know, as an intellectual exercise, what a more just world would look like. I start from what I think the world looks like and see where can I make a difference? Where can I make a difference? Where do I have the space, the agency to make a difference given the structure that I believe exists? That's a fundamental kind of difference of how you go at problems. Now it is really interesting because one of my biggest critics has been Tom Pogge. Wonderful, wonderful philosopher and a good friend, but you know, we go at it. And I, I read just something that Tom wrote, so I think he's coming to the dark side, you know, to my side on these issues. Because he writes, reforms that are not incentive compatible are destined to remain a philosopher's pipe dream. <laughs> it's interesting, and Tom, who's taken one of the leads, he's really been a leading voice in these debates on AIDS and access to AIDS drugs. Reforms that are not incentive compatible are just, uh, destined to remain a philosopher's pipe dream. So I think maybe he's uh, coming over. Now, why do I reject this cosmopolitan view? Okay, let me explain why. And hopefully I can do it very simply. Imagine this is really a map of Denmark. Let's say this is a map of Denmark. <laughs> what do I mean? We all agree Denmark's a very equal society, right? A pretty egalitarian society by industrial world standards. And basically, let's say that Rawls, in writing a theory of justice, was thinking about Denmark in his head. Okay? Are people more or less familiar with Rawls here? Uh, should I, guys back there? No, I'm not. Yeah, let me just give you two things. So John Rawls, of course, was the great moral philosopher who wrote A Theory of Justice, 1971. And a book, if you haven't read, you know, really uh, uh, take the time to read it. It's one of the most important books, I think, of the post-war period. And Rawls says we should think about justice in this way. We should imagine that all of us here are sitting behind a veil of ignorance when we establish the social contract, okay? So we imagine not ourselves as, you know, healthy, wealthy, whatever we are. We imagine ourselves as a representative individual. And we think of what could happen to us, our children, you know, over uh, the course of our lives, basically. And what social arrangements would we come up with from behind that veil of ignorance? And what Rawls argues is that we would come up with two uh, basic rules. One is that we should all have equal liberties. We should all have equal liberties. But the other is that those who are least advantaged among us should have the most opportunity to do well. In other words, we should maximize the opportunities available to the least advantaged to do well. That's his famous maximin principle. 